is nine is the time when I made myself a roommate in Peter. We attended those auditions and the producers told me you are not able to sing. I think that was uh, one of my biggest heartbreaks. When I was researching this, the first thing I came across was uh, that the fact that you fell in love with music at a, at a very young age. I think nine is the one I saw on the internet. I don't know how accurate that is, but it says you, you fell in love with music at a young age, but you faced heavy resistance. Uh, let's talk about that. What was going on there and how did you actually overcome that? Yeah, I think uh, with me, music is an inborn thing. Because I remember even as early as six years, my heart would beat very fast every time I saw somebody holding a guitar. So I think it was instilled inside me uh, from birth child. Yeah. So around age nine is the time when I made myself a roommate in guitar. Uh, and um, when my father discovered it, he was not happy. So I was beaten up a number of times <laughs> because of that. But I remained steadfast uh, because uh, I knew this is what I wanted. So I'm happy that I pursued the career. Yeah. There's, there's a bunch of interesting things there. Like, how do you learn to make a, a, a guitar at nine? Maybe talk me through that if you do remember. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there were a lot of people who were making homemade uh, tin guitars. So it was easy to just copy. You just take a gallon, then look for a plank. Because I remember that time our neighbor was a carpenter. So oh. I don't remember if I went and borrowed the plank or I just uh, helped myself. I don't remember. But um, I remember I took a gallon and put a plank, hammered some nails and drilled some holes and then put uh, some fishing lines. Oh, that was those are the but it had two strings only. <laughs> I mean, that's enough for someone who's, who's aching to play anything, I'm yeah. sure. <laughs> that, that was enough. Um, and so you, you start uh, pursuing music, like you said, uh, you remain steadfast. Uh, when do you then decide that you are going to be a musician? Was there an aha moment or you stumbled into that? Um, when I was in grade 7, I think I was t between 12 and 13 years old, yeah. I started discovering that I could compose music. So I started composing music. I still have my first uh, song to be right here. So when I noticed that I could compose music, that's when I decided that, you know what, I want to be in in the music industry full time. So that's when I started researching about the music industry, watching uh, documentaries about musicians, reading books about musicians, and listening to interviews as well of uh, local musicians. I wanted to get myself uh, as much knowledge as possible before I went in full time. So by the time I went in full time, I was 17, um, yeah. I already had so much knowledge about the music industry. Uh, the Zimbabwe music industry and the international music industry. So my choices were well informed. I hear you, I hear you. That's fantastic. And so you said something that's interesting. You said you started researching and for most people, most younger people who watch and listen to this, research to them means uh, Google, YouTube. We had, we have all these new tools. But for me, what's interesting is you guys didn't have any of them. Yeah, there was no so what there. does research mean in that context? Um, what I remember is I befriended a lot of older um, people who were also into music. So by, by befriending them, I would ask for books. Like, um, I remember the first book that I read was uh, a Bob Marley book, which uh, chronicled his story from a young age. And then the second book was uh, a Jimi Hendrix book, because Jimi Hendrix was my favorite um, guitarist and one of my biggest influences. Yeah. So after that, I sort of gained the skill of um, looking for those books. So I started looking for those books, looking for magazines. I had a huge collection of magazines where I would read a lot about uh, the music industry. And then later on, when I was, I think, around 16, that's when I decided, you know what, I'm just reading a lot about uh, foreign musicians, but I have zero knowledge about local musicians. Yeah. So I started looking for content. Um, on local musicians and listening to interviews by local musicians so that um, I know what's happening in Zimbabwe. So by the time I entered the music industry when I was, I was 17, 
uh, I had full knowledge. Yeah, yeah, that's mm. great. And so you enter uh, the music industry at 17. Mm. How does that happen? Did you have a big break? Did you start your own band? Were you independent? Were you signed to a label? Because I believe at that time there were la labels were still a thing locally. Yeah. Uh, what happened is, um, I as I grew older, I was now ashamed of playing a two-stringed uh, <laughs> woman guitar. <laughs> so I met somebody by chance named Last Saidi, and uh, I remember it was on 25 January 1988. Is the day he taught me uh, my first lesson on a proper guitar. Yeah. That was 1988. So within a very short time, I improved myself. And then as soon as I improved, I now had um, uh, something to give to those people that I wanted to borrow guitars from. Because most of them couldn't play. So I could teach them for free and then they would borrow me their guitar. So I think within two, three, four months, I was already playing um, very well. That's when I started my first band. It was called uh, Sarungami Chanters. The picture is right there. Yeah. I was 17. Yeah. So um, through research, through my research, I did a lot about uh, what happens in Zimbabwe music bands. There were a lot of superstitions. Uh, people saying if you join a big band, and uh, if somebody is fired because of you, they can bewitch you, blah, blah, blah. So um, I just made up my mind that uh, I don't want to join him, another band. I want wow. to form my own band. So at first I thought I was a good singer. So because I was the one composing the music. Yeah. So with my first band, we practiced. Then the following year, 1989, we started going for auditions. Uh, Grammar Records was the biggest. In fact, it was the only record company in Zimbabwe at mm -hmm. that time. Was it also housed uh, ZMC, which was its subsidiary? So it was just one company. Yeah. They would hold auditions every Monday. So we attended those auditions, and the producers told me, You are not a good singer. I think that was um, one of my biggest heartbreaks in life. <laughs> <laughs> they told me, Maybe you can be a big vocalist, but move away from the lead vocals. Yeah. So um, we looked for lead vocalists. And um, I carried on writing songs for the band, doing big vocals mm -hmm. and so forth. So that's how I entered the music industry professionally. That was 1988. Mm -hmm. You said something that's interesting there. So you are, uh, you own the band essentially, or at least you started the band. Mm -hmm. But now you have to uh, take a, a back seat and get a, a lead vocalist. Is my thinking correct in saying that usually the person who becomes the face or the lead vocalist essentially takes over a band. Was that one of the problems or that was never really a thing? Yeah, you are correct. That's a very good question because that problem haunted me uh, <laughs> <laughs> for a long time. Because um, every time you we hired somebody to be the lead vocalist, yeah. every time there was always a coup. It happened a <laughs> lot of times. So I suffered a number of coups because of that. But my idea was uh, I didn't want to join somebody's band. Was through my research, I noticed that in Zimbabwe, uh, uh, issues of payments, issues of remuneration were a very big problem. Was bands were known for being bad, bad, bad paymasters. So I didn't want to become a, in, an employee of somebody. Yeah. I wanted to to be... Your own boss. Yeah, yeah, my own boss. <laughs> so the idea was I wanted to copy a model that was used, um, or that is used by people like Carlos Santana. Carlos Santana is the lead of the band. And um, he writes some of the songs, you'll be playing guitar, but you'll be doing big vocals. Yeah. On, or groups like Sango Mota. Sango Mota, uh, Frank Lipa was the main composer, but the lead vocalist was Tsepo Chola. So that's what I wanted to be. Even if I was not the lead vocalist, I wanted to be one of the owners of the band. Yeah. Not to be some, one of somebody's guitarist. <laughs> I noticed that a lot of... Uh, um, what we, I mean, we used to think uh, now music is paying very well because you notice Thomas Mofumo driving a nice car, you notice um, uh, Olam driving a nice car, but no one thought of the guys behind the, the, scene. Guys behind the scene. And most yeah. of uh, those guys behind the scenes, they were not paid very well. So yeah. I wanted to avoid that. So for, for a long time, I tried to avoid uh, joining other people's bands as a, as a, just as a member, I wanted to be 
one of the owners of the building. Yeah. So I tried that for a number of times until it failed. Then <laughs> <laughs> I changed the formula. Yeah, so you, you spoke about failure there. And, and one of the things I noticed when I was uh, going through that uh, portfolio you sent me is that you started many bands mm -hmm. and many of them failed. Yeah. Um, apart from what you've already explained, were there other reasons for the failure of these bands? Uh, first of all, the first band was Sarungano Chanders, and um, we wanted to record, so we attended um, uh, auditions. I think we did more than 10 auditions and we failed all of them. And I do not blame anybody because we're still new <laughs> and uh, we're not yet ripe for, for recording. Yeah. The second band was called Chuck's Brothers. We also tried a lot of auditions and they failed again due to the same reasons. And um, we had members like uh, Mayaka Singer, Jackson P and so on, but still um, we failed to record. Then with my third band, we tried a number of auditions and then finally we were able to record 1992. The album was released in 1993, but as soon as the album was released, uh, before recording the album, we had made an agreement that the band was just going to be called the Crocodile Rockers Gang. Yeah. Um, it was in one of the first um, uh, guys who fought in the second liberation struggle, second Chimurina, they were called the Crocodile Gang. So we called ourselves the Crocodile Rockers Gang. Yeah. But when the album was released, the band leader went and changed the name of the band and it put his same name. <laughs> well, the same as Chicago. And um, as soon as the album was released, everything changed. He started dictating, and um, you could see that he had taken over the band. He was now the overall leader. All the agreements that we had made before the release of the album, they were all cancelled. So I just said, you know what, this is exactly what I was trying to run away from. So yeah. I'm not going to be a band member. So I quit. So I quit um, that band. It was, I think it was my third band. So after the third band, I just worked as a session musician, working for different artists until 1994 when I converted to Christianity and joined the AJ Gospel Train. Yeah. So in AJ Gospel Train, we did some recordings, but um, there were also some political issues, band politics. So I left the band again. Because uh, they, they had a law where they said uh, the band members were just supposed to play and the girls were supposed to sing. So band members, you can't record your own music or you can't do your own music. Because if you do your music, what would, what would the girls do? So <laughs> they wanted the girls to remain in front and the instrumentalists to remain behind. And yeah. I didn't want that. Yeah. So I quit and I joined another one called uh, the Christian Life Center. It was a church. It's now called uh, Faith in God. Everything there was okay, I was the band leader, but one big issue with churches is the payment issue, the, the, the remuneration issue. Yeah. It was uh, it was very little, so the pastors, every time you asked for more payment, you know, Christians will always <laughs> start giving new faces in the Bible. Yeah, you're serving. <laughs> yeah, you're serving the Lord, and uh, you're living by faith, God is going to reward you, blah, blah, blah. So I didn't want to wait till I die for me to be rewarded. To be rewarded. So <laughs> that's how I quit. And then I joined another band again. It was a church called the Revival Center. The payment was good, but the treatment was terrible. Wow. Because uh, the pastor wanted to be feared. He was a message. wanted everybody to... And I noticed that in, um, amongst the churches, that one is a very serious problem. Because what they call humility, is uh, being dumb and being uh, tolerating anything. Yeah. Following mm -hmm. instruction. Is yeah, that's what they call humility. <laughs> that's why they preach a lot about humility because their vision of humility is uh, totally different from the dictionary Biblical. definition. So I didn't want to, to live under such uh, conditions. But the good thing is that uh, every time I left a band where I was not satisfied, I'll make sure that I explain everything so that they know, so that they don't have to guess why I left. Why left. So I always told them the truth that I'm not happy with this. I'm not happy with the way you are treating us. I'm not happy with the way um, you treat us like small children. Because I remember one church that I worked for, the pastor would beat up the band members right in front of the <laughs> church. So I was telling them, how can I uh, yeah, yeah. be beaten when my wife is sitting there, when my child is sitting there? And they would call it humility. If you accept or if you tolerated that humiliation, you would be called humble. 
you'll be giving as an example. You see, this man is very humble. You can even beat him up in front of the church and he doesn't care. So to wow. me, I, I didn't wow. want to bow to such stupid doctrines, so yeah. I left. Yeah. So that's when, I think in 2000, year 2000, that's when I just decided, you know what, I don't want to work under churches anymore. I'd worked for churches from 1994 to year 2000. So for six years, six years. I worked full time in churches and um, I didn't like what I saw. I didn't like the hypocrisy, the treatment, the remuneration and everything. So that's, that's how I quit the, the churches and that's how some of the groups failed answering your, your question. Yeah, yeah. So, so there's something interesting there. Uh, you went from what is described as secular music Mm -hmm. uh, to a very different type of music, essentially gospel and, and praise and worship and whatnot. Um, are there any differences between uh, being in a in a secular band and being in a in a gospel band that stood out to you during these times? Um, in all my traveling, um, the first time I went to America, I was expecting to face a culture shock. But the biggest culture shock that I got was when I joined the gospel, the gospel music fraternity. It was a serious culture shock because there was a lot of hypocrisy. I remember one band, the pastor was sleeping with all the three girls. Oh. And there was a wife beater who beat up his wife. So I was asking myself, you know what? I came from the secular world. I married. I treated my wife well. But I was called a sinner. And this guy <laughs> is a preacher. And um, he's treating his wife like this. He beat up his wife and uh, sleep with all the girls in the team. But he was considered somebody holy and yeah. given a lot of respect. So it was a serious culture shock. Was a, I was really shocked. And when it comes to remuneration issues, it's far more worse in the gospel music circles. It's very serious. Because uh, they use the Bible to justify their mismanagement. So... Everything, when everything, when every bad behavior is uh, justified by religion, it becomes worse. Yeah. So, uh, the gospel music fraternity, I didn't enjoy it that much. I used to watch it from afar and I thought it was perfect, but when I got in, I discovered I would be better off playing in secular music bands. Yeah. So, when all of them took approach me, I took it and uh, my life changed and I was treated very well as compared to I was treated in churches. Yeah. So before we, we touch on your experience with, with Oliver Mtukuzi, um, is there anything you you learned from all these failures? Because you you like you said, uh, you started in eighty eight. Uh, two thousand you were still going at it and, and, and hitting brick walls, be it a church, circular, and like you said, coups, uh, just those uh, crisis of identity, seeing uh, your your faith being tested. How do you, how do you soldier on? Because for most people, twelve years, committing twelve years, which are largely uh, not what you want to be, it feels like you you went where you wanted to be. Uh, how did you go through that? What what were the things you learned? Um, I learned a lot uh, with the journey that I went through. I've got zero regrets, but I've got lessons. Uh, so. If yeah. you interpret well what you went through, you don't regret, you you learn. So I learned a lot. That's why I, I wrote a book which I released in uh, 2017 called um, Following the Melody. I was uh, highlighting all my mistakes and all the mistakes and all the struggles that I went through. I never sugarcoated anything. Uh, so I think uh, there are a lot of lessons that I learned, uh, especially with issues... Um, on brand management and um, writing things down, writing contracts. Because most of the time, we we'll just get in with that in office. <laughs> and then after some time, things will change and yeah. things will be twisted. Uh, they will tell you, you, remember that day when you said this and that? <laughs> and you don't even remember the day. <laughs> and you never said it. <laughs> and you never said it. So the best, uh, one of the biggest lessons that I learned is you need to write things down. Everything has to be written down clearly so that uh, you don't uh, have any distortions uh, later on. Yeah, yeah. So let's get into that experience you you mentioned prior with with uh, Oliver Mchukuti, who is uh, arguably one of our greatest uh, local musicians. Uh, how did you get to work with Oliver Mchukuti? Um, it was two thousand and three. Um, his guitarist at the time was uh, Pilani Dube, and Pilani wasn't feeling well, so. 
they could tell that uh, it will be a problem if they took him on tour because he had a huge American tour, huge European tour the same year. So they started looking for a guitarist who could play um, some urban traditional music, who could play a bit of jazz and a bit of some Western styles. Because if you listen to all of this music, it sort of has elements of everything. It's largely Zimbabwean, but it has got uh, elements of jazz, elements of some slight Western music. So the guitarists that they found, some of them would be playing Western styles very well, playing their jazz very well, but when you try to give them Zimbabwean music, they couldn't play. Some yeah. guitarists could play Zimbabwean music, but they couldn't. <laughs> play them. The so everybody was telling him, look for Mono, look for Mono. So he didn't know me. And um, a friend of mine, Blessing Parutza, who is uh, husband to Dudu Maninga, mm -hmm. uh, took a video of me playing live and gave it to Debbie. He wanted us to to form a jazz band and record in South Africa since Debbie was connected to South Africans. He wanted Debbie to see the video and so that she can organize um, a deal in South Africa. So when Debbie saw the video, she said, ah, you know what, this guitarist we want in, in our this band. So, so she started making plans, but she didn't know my name that time. And then Tuku had met me teaching guitar at Prince Edward School. So to go, I was saying, if we don't find Mono, we are going to look for that guy who was teaching guitar at Prince Edward School. <laughs> or we might look for the guy who was playing guitar on that video. <laughs> <laughs> Me, myself and I. Yeah. Three guys. <laughs> <laughs> so they were looking for three people, and uh, all the three people was me. So uh, 2003 February, that time I was now teaching guitar at the Zimbabwe College of Music. That's when Dave called me and uh, invited me for a, for, for, for a practice session. She just said, can you please come to our practice session? We have a rehearsal tomorrow. Please, please bring your guitar. So I didn't even know that it was an audition. So yeah. I went there, uh, met some few familiar faces. So took that time I was rehearsing for the album Tio. So what you would do is you would just start playing a song and uh, tell me to come in with my own lines. So as a session musician, as somebody who had been working as a session guitarist for a long time, I was very good at uh, catch, catch, catching the, the, how a song was going, and I was very good at creating melodies. So I was just coming, so I was very happy with that. So after that, he never told me that I was now in the band. He, he just said, I really like the way you play, I really like the way you compose your, your guitar lines. Mm -hmm. So he just gave me a heap of his... Um, CDs, a huge catalog. I still have all the all the songs in my machine I, to turn them into MP3s. Yeah. So he just gave me a huge catalog of his music and he told me, in your spare time on this album, release this song and this song and release this song and this song. Then um, for the following days, I would come for practice and we we're just practicing for that uh, practicing for that single album. And that guy Pilano was still okay that particular time. So yeah. they were saying, I will practice for. For, for, for tours later and then all of a sudden Pilani fell ill and um, I had to come and play live and I never played the old material so he just called me uh, I think an hour before the show and he said you have to come play uh, the show he said but I never practiced the, the old material we had just busy practicing the latest album and he just said just come so the first gig I played um, without rehearsal, and he um, would whisper in my ear and say, do you know Ziwele, the guitar line for Ziwele? And I said, is it the one that goes, and he says, that's the one. <laughs> then I'll try it silently, and then I, I told him, I tell him, I got it. And then I'll start it. So the show went on like that until the show was finished. So I thought after that, Tuku is going to say, okay, now let's go and practice the, the show repertoire. But he never did. <laughs> he just told me, tomorrow we're going to South Africa, then after South Africa we're going to UK, after UK we're going to the States. Yeah. But we had not practiced anything. So I had to find my own time to rehearse the old oh, song. Because he had so much faith in me, was I was very quick in catching up the melodies. Yeah. So he just said, ah, this guy, maybe he just said this guy can play anything. So he never <laughs> rehearsed with me. So it was up to me to start working on the, on the old material. 
So that's how I joined the band. That was uh, February 2003, and we traveled around the world. I learned a lot, and uh, even the studio equipment that I have now, yeah, I bought it during the time of Olam Mutukuz. And uh, Olam Mutukuz was a very good paying master. I think the two people that I worked with that were very good paying masters is Olam Mutukuz and Chunis Omarai. Yeah. So it was a huge experience in traveling around the world. I'm somebody who loves to learn, so every time we played with other musicians, I would be noticing what they're doing on stage and um, learning a lot from how they, they are moving the crowds and uh, getting a lot of tips and even speaking to other musicians, speaking to everybody. So that period of time was a very good um, period for me. I think it's the best time that I, I was in the music industry. Yeah. But in February 2007, um, he hired a new manager, and the new manager fired all of us. <laughs> so all seven of us were fired uh, February 2007. Yeah, I, I, I read that and I found that interesting. Uh, what, what was the reason? Uh, were you, were, was the band underperforming? Was it, uh, I'm the new guy here, new guy, new girl here, uh, things go my way? How? What, what do you think happened there? Or what um, do you know happened The band there? was... People used to call the band the A-team because I remember we would fill up HICC and people would be taken away when they were in the space. Yeah. And um, so when the new manager came, I think he had new ideas. He wanted to hire um, guys who are still new in the music industry um, so that they don't give them problems when it yeah. comes to payments. <laughs> So they had guys who were still very young, who were still very new in the music industry. Some played marimba, some played um, lira. But uh, it seems like his audience did not like the drastic changes. And his audience in Zimbabwe started going down. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, after some time, he reverted back to having a full band. Because that time when, he, when, when we were fired, he was not playing uh, without a lead guitar, without keyboards. He was just using marimba and lira. But the people didn't like it. His audience did not like it, so he went back to the full band setup. To a full band setup, but with me, we remained very close. We remained very close. So he would even invite me for his bigger shows. Like um, every year, he would celebrate his birthday. It was on twenty two September, yeah. and he would invite people like Yuma Sekela, Ringo, and so forth, Dorot Masuka, and he would call me to come and play for. For those artists, yeah. so every time I would go to his uh, the celebrations and play for the likes of Yuma Sekela and so forth, so we remained very close until he passed away. Yeah, mm. yeah. I think um, that period you talked about, the early early to late two thousand, was I was very young. So correct mm. me if I'm wrong, but it felt like that was peak Chuku, if, if I'm not mistaken. It felt. <laughs> He was he was he was huge. Yeah, the um, time he was very huge. He was huge, and um, he would fill up. Uh, like I said, he would fill up HICC, and people would be turned away. Yeah. And uh, every time he had a show, they'd call riot police to control the crowds. <laughs> <laughs> and in countries like South Africa, he would be received like a, like a diplomat. Even in Zambia, I remember the other time we were received by a police escort in Zambia. Yeah. In Kenya, he was received. <laughs> models and the, they organized a proper welcome like he was treated like a dignitary yeah one. yeah so that was that was his peak for sure yeah so you worked with him during his peak uh, i'm sure you had researched him way before because he was still a big artist um what what do you think set someone like oliver mtukuzi apart from his contemporaries in the industry yeah that's a very good question because that's why a lot of people are losing it oliver mtukuzi's music was very zimbabwean and uh, the world is not kind to copycats. The world music industry is very ruthless to, to, to copycats. You have to be original, you have to be authentic. And by authentic, I mean doing music uh, which sounds like where you come from, singing yeah. about things that you lived. That's why in rap music, they talk about, um, they, call, they call it being real. Because you can't sing about um, anything which you have never tried. <laughs> Or, true, true. <laughs> so Tupu's music was very original. He did not sound like anybody else. He sounded like himself, and his music was very Zimbabwean. 
So everywhere we went, sometimes we'd share the stage with very big um, artists from USA, from Europe. Yeah. And you would feel ashamed to go on stage because uh, you'll be doing your music. No one can correct you. Yeah. They have, should have played like this. <laughs> so his biggest uh, weapon or his biggest selling point was he was original and he was authentic. He was doing his bubble music. And a lot of youngsters, that's why they lose it. They think that if they copy Nigerians, Jamaicans, Americans or South Africans, that's their ticket to international stardom. But it doesn't work like that. Yeah. And if you look at Zimbabwean music history, Zimbabwean music history started in 1930. Up to now, there's not even a single artist who has made money by playing foreign music. But still, people uh, value, they place value on storytelling than evidence. <laughs> so they keep doing the same thing over and over and over again. So that's why they lose it. Because yeah. right now, I was speaking to another promoter. He was telling me that Right now in Zimbabwe, the biggest crowd puller is now Machisu because Mutuku has passed away. Yeah. And uh, all the other youngsters, some of them had good crowds, but then they started copying Nigerians, they started copying South Africans, and yeah. their crowds are going down. <laughs> and I don't know whether they are noticing it or not, but their value is going down. Yeah. They are now releasing music which does not last two weeks. After two weeks, the music is gone. Yeah. Uh, so. Yeah. It's really sad. But the good thing is uh, a number of them, I spoke to them and told them, you know what, guys, you are killing your brands by copying Nigerians. Stick to your music. And they bluntly, bluntly refused. So I just said, well, let the music industry itself teach them. But the music industry is not a good teacher. It's a very good place to teach. Yeah, yeah, that's very true. So when you were talking about Mchukudi, you talked also about Chuonise, uh, Chuoniso. Uh, and not much is, is documented on the internet as when I was researching. Uh, are there any big differences between, were there any big differences between working for her and, and working for Mutukuzi? And maybe what are some of your, your, your fond memories of those experiences? Um, I think there were more similarities than differences. Because Shoniso's music was very Zimbabwean and uh, working with her, uh, she didn't want to appear like a boss who wanted to be feared to just relax and joke together. And that's exactly what um, Olo Mtukuz used to do as well. So even when it comes to issues of paying band members, both of yeah. them were, were very good at paying band members. Although Chioniso went a step further. Because with Chioniso, you would agree on a certain amount. But after the tour, she'll give you more than what you agreed on. So Chioniso had... Um, I don't know what philosophy of life she lived on, but she was very different, very liberal, very loving. And some of the times I remember she was working with another group of artists. After they, after she had paid everybody, she just took the, 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 the bag with the money and threw it at the guys and said, share amongst yourselves. That's how she was. <laughs> so she lived a... I think she had a very good philosophy that she followed. Because even at a house, she would um, help street kids, she would feed street kids. And uh, yeah. you always find a place filled with a lot of people. Some of them who are not even related to her, who are not even her friends. She was just somebody who wanted to, to give. And the funny thing is that she was born in the States. She came to Zimbabwe. I think she was a teenager when she came to Zimbabwe. Yeah. But um, she was very much in touch with the modern culture. She was speaking Shona fluently. So I think the main contribution to her goodness is how she was raised. That's what I think. Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah, that's a very, <laughs> it's very surprising. Yeah. <laughs> and she also, one thing about it, she was very secure. Most Zimbabwean artists are very insecure. Yeah. You are not even allowed to greet fans or talk to the promoters if you are on tour. But she only so would ask her band members to perform their own songs on her show. Oh. That will never happen with Zimbabweans. <laughs> Zimbabweans are very insecure. They are, they are just afraid of um, coups. They will never allow you to go. Even if you get a lot of support from the audience, it can get you in trouble. Ah. Yeah, it can get you in trouble. So what when, kind of a situation is that? Like maybe a guitarist who yeah. also dances and is performative. Then, yeah. So every time you join a band, you need to check the weather, <laughs> <laughs> the political weather. So 
what's allowed in this bed, what's not allowed, which is too far and which is... Uh, what's the safe place? Yeah, uh, the safest place. Because you, at times you'll be walking on eggshells. I remember one guitarist was beaten up by the band leader after a fan asked for his phone number. But, wow. And he was beaten up. He passed away, but he passed away with a, with a, with a gap in his tooth. Wow. I don't know even wow. after he wow. was beaten up by the band leader. Just for giving his number to, 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 to a band. Yeah. So there's a lot that happens in the Zimbabwe music industry which people are afraid to talk about. But the good thing is I'm not afraid of it. Yeah, yeah, so I think. I think they the have more to knowledge. Be good. Yeah. <laughs> because uh, I believe the truth can set you free and the half truths can bind you more. So yeah. you need to yeah. say it as yeah. it is. Zimbabwean artists are very insecure. That's, do you do you think that's still a thing in today's music industry? Mm -hmm. It's still there. That's why if you are my band member and you record your music, you are fired. Oh, because it's like yeah, you're challenging yeah. my authority. And if you read the newspapers, a lot of band members yeah. will be fired for <laughs> recording their own music. There's a story I thought of, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's besides the point. <laughs> <laughs> so... Uh, Maybe just touching a bit on something that's a bit uh, more personal, mm -hmm. because uh, people view musicians and and people in the entertainment industry generally in a very <laughs> in a certain way. Mm -hmm. I think you understand what I mean. <laughs> yeah, I do. Um, but uh, you you me you mentioned previously as we were talking that uh, you you saw a contrast between how a certain pastor was treating his wife and women in the church uh, contrasted with how you were treating your own wife who uh, you respect and you've spoken about this in, in, in multiple interviews and uh, an interesting thing you've mentioned you've also mentioned before is um, you've always viewed uh, marriage as a business decision mm -hmm. uh, what does that mean uh, being an artist um, I think an artist has to be very careful when he's choosing somebody to marry who's a who you marry will affect your career later because uh, you need somebody who understands um, your your career and uh, who is not intimidated by your fans but of course in the music industry there's a lot of temptations and um, a lot of uh, that's why a lot of musicians passed away during the between 1985 to year, year 2000 especially yeah. from 1990 to year 2000 a lot of musicians passed away of uh, AIDS and that time there was no AR of this. So back to the question, um, I think it's very important for a musician to marry somebody who understands his career. And um, I think it's even far much better to marry before you are famous. Well, because once you are famous, you attract <laughs> a lot of fleas, you attract a lot of parasites. Yeah. So I think the best would be for a musician to marry before they are famous, <laughs> marry somebody who is um, humble enough and who supports their career. And um, yeah, I think that's that's my advice to to musician every time I speak to to, to to youngsters. Yeah, yeah, that's very interesting. Mm. Uh, and then. Coming back more to industry specific stuff. Um, no, we actually skipped something that's very a very cool <laughs> story. <laughs> it's very foundational. Mm. <laughs> the name Mono. So I I kept coming back to it because of the picture I keep seeing. Okay. <laughs> Where did the name come from? I know this should have been one of the first, but I mean <laughs> Yeah. Um I used to love dreadlocks a lot. So they were not allowed in school. So yeah. what I did is I grew a single dreadlock which uh, I used to call a monologue. So I would hide it in my afro. So after school, ah. I would take it out. So <laughs> people started calling me monologue until it was shortened to mono. mono. Mm. And now it's Monolio Studios. And yeah. It's become it's a new brand. From, from that name. <laughs> okay, <laughs> that's fantastic. <laughs> Going back to what I was actually about to ask you uh, is, uh, you saw a local uh, music industry that could be monetized. Uh, at least you had uh, labels like you like you mentioned earlier mm -hmm. and uh, i think now and correct me if i'm wrong we see one that is almost impossible to monetize. at least it's very difficult to monitor mm -hmm. for for newer artists um why is it so difficult now for local musicians to make money from from their craft um 
the biggest issue there are a number of um, issues mm -hmm. that uh, that contribute number one our economy is very i mean is very much in tatters number two our population is very small because yeah. if you look at countries where music uh, brings in uh, more money countries like south africa tanzania Nigeria, the RSC, they've got huge populations. Even in America, they've got 300 million people yeah. in one country. So our population is very small, we're just 15 million. As a result, um, the money that we make in Zimbabwe is very little. And then number two, we used to have record labels. Record labels, they used to provide guidance and um, they used to make the business side easier because they would do all the business side for the musicians. Yeah. But when digitalization came, they couldn't stand the heat, so they, the companies went out of business. And for musicians to be the artist and the marketing person at the same yeah. time, it's very difficult. As a result, things have gone out of hand. Yeah. In the last year, um, National Council, they conducted the survey, and they were saying that 34% uh, of Zimbabweans um, access their music via streaming, which is a very small number. Yeah, and they said yeah, uh, yeah. it's only 3% of artists last year who managed to get anything around 500 US dollars in Zimbabwe. Combining all the artists, it's just 3% 3, 3 of artists who managed to get something like 500 US dollars for the whole year. Yeah, which isn't much. Yeah, <laughs> 500 dollars. <laughs> <laughs> it's not it. <laughs> then uh, they were saying 23% they consume music via WhatsApp platforms where it's just shared for free. Yeah. And then they said uh, it's only 6% who buy CDs. So you can tell that everything is in charters. Well, yeah. So yeah. Yeah. that's why I always advise artists that, um, that want to enter the music industry that they must take music as a side hustle first until it can pay more than the main hustle. That's when you can you can quit your job. Don't be quick to quit your job because music doesn't pay that much in Zimbabwe. Yeah. And then even if it starts paying you, you must also invest and save. But artists have got a problem of status signaling. Yeah. Every artist who makes a small breakthrough, they want to buy Mercedes Benz and live yeah. a very expensive <laughs> life. And when they fall sick, they've got nothing else to, to, fall, to, back to fall back on. And, uh, even this COVID period that um, that was bedeviling us, a lot of artists they suffered a lot because uh, none had saved money. Yeah. Because right now, if you look at all the youngsters who have had hits um, the past few years, they all have Mercedes Benzes and uh, they live a life where they want to show world that they do not have, yeah. and that alone is a serious disaster. So back to the question. Uh, the reason why we fail to make money is because, number one, our bad economy, number two, our small population, number three, lack of uh, record labels. Yeah. Those are our three main problems. Yeah. So you, you talked about uh, status signaling, and you've actually got a, a book about this, uh, Famous Poor and Famous. Ah, poor. Mm. Oh, poor and Famous. Yeah. So <laughs> what pushed you to write that and maybe just talk about the book a bit more so that maybe people can know where to find it and what's in the book yeah around 2015 a number of people were sending me questions on facebook concerning the music industry so i would reply publicly then within a short time it became a very popular program people were sending me questions even as far as uh, tanzania south africa Botswana. they were saying we're enjoying please don't use too much shona because we also want to learn so, <laughs> so i started writing them in english and um posting them on on Facebook. So it became very popular. Then somebody, a guy named the Blessing Vava, he was the one who said, oh, why don't you turn this into a book? So that's how I came to write the book. So most of the questions that were being asked had a lot to do with the welfare of artists. Yeah. Uh, people were asking, why is it our artists are poor? Why is it um, they don't make money? Blah, blah, blah. So that was one of the main topics that I covered in the book. That's why I decided to call the book Poor and Famous. Yeah. Mm. yeah. And where can people find it? Maybe upcoming artists or just people who are interested in, in knowledge? They can buy it on Amazon or they can buy it straight from me. There are a few uh, bookstores in town that sell the book. All but right. um, 
I mean, you can always give me the list and we just <laughs> yeah. put it over I, the... I don't remember the names of the the the, the bookshops, but people can simply contact me. Yeah. And on all my social media platforms, I just use the name Mono Mkuli. They can okay. just contact me and then we'll see what we can do. Okay, that's fantastic. Yeah. Um, so another thing you are a big proponent of <laughs> is singing in local languages i mean you've alluded to some of it in all the in some of the previous questions we, we've talked about but i mean why is that the case you you're a big proponent of local languages yeah um i believe music uh, language is an instrument because if you listen to like latino music when they sing in their languages yeah. there's some very interesting rhythms that you feel the moment they start singing in english the, 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 those elements are gone. Yeah. The same thing if you listen to DRC Rumba, when they sing in their languages, there there's a certain feel that yeah. you, you that you hear. And when the moment they try to sing in Shuan or Shona, English, yeah. it's gone. Yes. So <laughs> I used to have that question myself, and I, I would ask myself, how does Oliver Mtukuzi, Thomas Mapumo, Bundy Boys go and perform in Europe where there are no Zimbabweans and sing in Shuan? So the question was answered when I started touring with Oliver Mtukuz. Because um, I discovered that his Shona songs were even more popular amongst foreigners. And I noticed that the, what's um, attracting or what's, uh, what the foreigners are enjoying is the rhythms that are found in the Shona language. Because every language has got certain rhythms, certain tonalities. And uh, it shapes the way you sing. It shapes your melodies. Yeah. So most youngsters uh, believe that for you to be international, you have to sing in English only. You have to do music that uh, is played in European countries. But as I mentioned before, if you look at our music history, it's only those that did local music, only those that sang in Shona who made it international. Yeah. So my idea is uh, language is an instrument on its own because it shapes how you write your melodies, it shapes the rhythms in your in your music. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's clear enough. And then, um, as we get closer to the end, I just want to touch on a few interesting things that I picked up uh, from from some of your other interviews. Mm. <laughs> One of which, and and correct me if I'm wrong, this apparently made people quite angry at the time. Uh, you said. Uh, the best in instrumentalists you had seen were in Harare, and they were thirty. They were under thirty-five. Mm -hmm. um, so apparently that made people angry, but that's besides the point. Uh, my question is: Is that mm -hmm. still the case? And if yes, um, what do you think it is that gives uh, the younger people an edge? Yeah, the younger people of today have got uh, main advantages. Number one, they've got the internet, so they can research and research and research. There are a lot of lessons, a lot of lots of tutorials online and number two they've got parental support our generation we did not have parental support imagine i got up to 17 while, while still playing a homemade guitar yeah. but these days these youngsters at any age they have instruments the parents they support they even take them for lessons and so forth that alone uh, makes them better because they've got the resources they've got the support they've... my son is also a guitarist and i believe he's now far much better than me because I taught him when he was young, yeah. and um, all these guitars were here, and uh, also because of the internet, there is Wi-Fi here, he's always Googling online. And uh, when I taught him, I stopped monitoring him for some time. The next time I heard him play, I was shocked. Ah, where did he learn this? Yeah. Oh, no. And then uh, I started attending his shows, I was shocked by what I saw. Was, um, that's when I also started noticing a trend amongst uh, the youngsters. Yeah. And I noticed that mm, the youngsters are, are on fire. And I'm also a music producer. So I noticed that, um, for example, I was recording a session and uh, this artist came with his own uh, wind instrumentalist and the guy was struggling. He was an older guy who was struggling to get the melodies. And then I told him to call Joseph Shinori, he's a very young saxophone player. Yeah. What we had failed to do in more than an hour, Joseph came and did it in less than five minutes. Well, he was very really fast, he was always practicing, and he was always trying everything. He plays Latin American music, he plays jazz, he plays everything. Yeah. So 
that alone, uh, to me, it's something, it shows that we are growing as a nation. Yeah. Because yeah. I've been to other countries like Zambia. Right now in Zambia, they don't have youngsters who play instruments. Because yeah. everybody's trying to be American in Zambia. <laughs> uh, they, they are busy creating beats and uh, using computer to create beats. It's very rare to see a youngster playing instruments in Zambia. So to me, it's something that really interested me. We have so, many, so much talent amongst the youngsters. The other time I was recording an artist from Zambia, and she said, I want a full band. And I called in youngsters. And she was saying, you know, these guys can play. And I told, told her, wait until we start the session. And she was shocked. Yeah. And uh, the other time, there's this artist from South Africa, Zaza. She came to perform in Zimbabwe. And um, they asked um, Zimpreis to, to, to bake it. So my son is part of Zimpreis. Yeah. And uh, he's 22. And uh, Joseph Chinori is, is on saxophone. He's in his 20s again. Uh, Naftal on bass is in his 20s. Um, uh, what's his name? Uh, Madiwali on drums is in his 20s. Archie on keyboard is in his 20s. Yeah. And the manager was saying, ah, so you mean these youngsters? <laughs> Are the ones who are going to bake us, then they demanded a long practice session, thinking, ah, we are going to be in trouble. <laughs> so they stepped aside and the guys were setting up. When they were setting up, they started playing, they were shocked. Yeah. And um, they reduced their practice time. And after the show, she came and shook their hands with, ah, I didn't know that there, 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 there was so much talent here in Zimbabwe. Yeah. So it's not only us Zimbabweans who are getting surprised. All our neighbors are getting shocked. Oh, you have so much talent in Zimbabwe amongst the youngsters. So to me, it's not like no data good old they're now better than me. Yeah. To me, it's something to celebrate <laughs> on. Something Everyone to celebrate. Wins. <laughs> mm. Yeah. So another thing we had almost uh, skipped over is is your your journey into production because now you have a studio. Mm. Uh, maybe two questions there uh, what informed that and and how did you how did you actually get into setting it up and then it becoming a thing okay i'll start with question number two yeah what happened is um i've been a session musician for a long time i think right now i'm featured over a thousand albums so mm. by getting into the studio very often you start uh, learning a lot you start getting extra cur curriculum knowledge yeah. So I started um, getting hired by musicians to arrange their music and I didn't know that it was part of music production. So the other time I was in the studio, 2001, I had visited my friend who was producing Elias Musab and uh, there was something happening with the band and they were trying to solve the problem and they were failing to solve it. So when I came in, I told him, you know what, I think the guy who is playing the rhythm guitar is the problem, the way he's playing, blah, blah. Can you stop his guitar, meet his guitar? They stopped the guitar and the music went back to, yeah. to, 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 to normal. So after that, they solved the problem. So the engineer, there was an engineer called Clancy Mirimi and uh, Elias Musako was the producer. So Clancy is the one who said to Musako, why don't you make more of the producer and you just become the executive producer? Because the executive producer is the one who funds. Mm -hmm. So that's how I came into music production, that was 2001. But after some time, I noticed that I was producing all these artists and my name was not credited on the album sleeves. So at first I complained and then it was corrected just on one album. <laughs> then the second batch of albums were released and my name was not there. And I said, you know what, I quit. So I yeah. quit music production. So I just said to myself, when I come back into the music production, I want to own the equipment so that no one can steal my credit again. Yeah. So when I joined the Oliver Tukuzi, I noticed that his um, remuneration was very good. So I got a chance to, I noticed a chance to to buy my own equipment. So every time we tra traveled with Oliver Tukuzi to USA and so forth, I would bring something. So I started buying 2004 up to 2006. That's when the equipment uh, was uh, finally enough. And then, back to question number one, uh, I think what informed my production was uh, the experience as a session guitarist and as well as working with other music producers. There's one producer called Andrew Bates, the one who used to produce for Celebration Choir. 
and uh, I'm the one I'm one guitarist who would call every time we would record uh, his music because he used to like how punctual I was yeah. and uh, everything. So uh, he started noticing his production style, how he produced. He would first shape the music on his own, and then later on call session musicians and so forth. So I really liked the way he produced. So I, I would ask him questions. I would uh, notice everything that he was doing. So I copied a lot from him. So when I started my own studio, I just started by applying what I learned from End of Bed, and then also applied stuff of my own. Mm. So that's how I created my own production style. Mm. That's great, that's great. And then, so I've got uh, two more questions, one more serious than the other. But um, <coughs> you, you said uh, PE mm. uh, produces uh, the best instrumentalists in the country. Uh, mm. What do they have there? Uh, they've got a very serious uh, music culture at Prince Edward. Because uh, what they do is, uh, if you are good in sports, they, they make sure that you, you get the best uh, coaching. If you are good in music, they make sure that you get all the resources and all the coaching and all the encouragement. So as a result, they don't take music as something that's not important, something to do in extracurricular activities they take yeah. music as a core subject so i think they were the first to have a proper band a proper school band that could really play like adults yeah. so as a result standards were set long long time ago i think in the 90s was pe always had a, a very tight band so because of the setting of the standards every year if you go and watch uh, a Prince Edward band playing, uh, you'll be shocked. Ah, these, these are kids and they're playing like this. And most mm -hmm. of them will be playing in big bands whilst they're still at school. Oh. Because if you look at uh, accomplished instrumentalists like Josh Meg, my son Takakunda, Joseph Shinori, Naftali Chwandikwa, uh, Blessing Chimanga, they all came through PE. So it's a culture at the school. There's a yeah. very strong music culture. And the the youngsters will be competing against each other. So that competition, I think, it pushes them to, to excel. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So to, to close this off, um, you you recently celebrated your 51st birthday. I hope I'm right when I say yeah, 51. And the internet <laughs> didn't lead me. <laughs> so yeah. congratulations on that. Uh, yeah, thank that's you. a big milestone. Mm -hmm. um, what's the biggest lesson you've learned in, in your half century of existence? Um, I think you can, one can easily destroy their future by enjoying their youth in the wrong way. Or, yeah. So most people will be thinking they're enjoying their youth when they're busy destroying their future. So I think one thing that made me to live up to this age is uh, uh, when we started the music industry, you know, there are a lot of temptations, women, yeah. they come. Well, in the band that I played for, I was the youngest, so the temptations were many, <laughs> and um, all my friends were into sleeping around, and uh, at first I said, I don't want to get into this, but I was uh, pressured by peer pressure, but the good thing is uh, God found a very funny way to, to correct me, because the first time I tried to, not, not, not try, as such, the first time I slept with a woman, I got a serious STI, yeah. which lasted uh, more than two weeks. Yeah. Oh, no. So I said to myself, ah, <laughs> I won't do this again. Yeah. Oh, no. yeah. But as soon as I got healed, I did it again with somebody different and got another STI, <laughs> a stronger one. And then I just said, you know what, anybody who wants to laugh at me can laugh all they want. I'm going to abstain until I get married. So yeah. I, I abstained until I got married. That's how I survived. Because my friends, uh, the ones that I was playing with in that band, all mm -hmm. of them, they are dead. All wow. of them. And in fact, wow. the majority of the fans of the guys that I started music with, they are all dead. I had to look for new friends. They are all dead because of um, HIV, isn't it? HIV, AIDS, and uh, promiscuity. Because it's very difficult to resist um, a woman, a beautiful woman advancing. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. Yeah, so that's why 
musicians died a lot, especially during the 90s, between 1995 and 2000. A lot of musicians died, and it was all due to promiscuity. Because in the music industry, they are what they are what we call groupies. Yeah, it's women who just want to sleep with musicians for nothing. They don't want to be paid. They don't want anything. They just want to <laughs> sleep with a musician. Then they feel good with that. Slept with so and so. Yeah. And uh, it's an international problem worldwide. So in Zimbabwe, it's there as well. So yeah. I managed to avoid it after my STIA encounters. Yeah. That's how I managed to survive up to now. No, man, uh, that's, that's great to hear. And thankfully, you weren't uh, one of the casualties. But um, thanks for, for having us and, and sharing your story with us. Thank you very much. <laughs>